to get through during the talk. It was all a very informal thing. Um, so, uh, a couple of disclaimers. First of all, I am entirely ripping this entire lecture from this book, uh, The uh, Copernican Revolution by Thomas Kuhn. It's a very good book. Um, and I figured I would be in more solid ground if I uh, didn't attempt to make a synthesis myself that followed uh, the structure of this, and so that's what I'm going to do. Um, I think history of science is a very interesting and useful endeavor. It's interesting in the sense that it requires a certain um, mode of thought. It requires you to put aside your presuppositions about what the world is actually like and try to um, look at the world as people in the past would have looked at it. So it's going, to be, it's going to be an experience, and part of that's on me to attempt to make these things sound plausible to you, but part of it's on you, too, to attempt to look at things the way that you know, the ancients would have looked at it, the way that people were going to be talking about what it looked at. And it's a very useful endeavor because it gives us a more um, correct view of science. It lets us see how science actually came about. We have a very um, twisted and narrow view of what the history of science is that we get from science classrooms. And the, what I'm going to be giving you is going to be certainly a simplified version. It's incredibly simplified. There is each, you know, each sentence I say is going to be the sort of thing that we could, we could write pages about why it's not entirely correct. But at the same time, I'm hoping to give you a simplified version that doesn't distort it the same way that the simplified version we already have does. So I'm hoping to give you a simplified but relatively accurate version rather than simplified but distorted version. Um, so um, I'm essentially going to walk through the uh, history of astronomy and cosmology up to Newton, focusing especially on geocentric models because they're the most interesting because they're the weirdest, at least in modern terms. Um, so let's start out with the very, uh, the very ancients. And primitive cosmologies, anything I say about them is going to be incorrect because there are you know, as many of them as there are oral traditions. But at the same time, there are some basic features that we can see. In a primitive cosmology, you generally have some sort of stationary Earth because the Earth was clearly not moving. You have some sort of dome of the stars, because if you look at the stars, it, it's a dome. You generally have features that relate to uh, what's going on around the people. So for example, the ancient Egyptians, their uh, cosmology was of an elongated platter um, with a dome of the sky over it. And the, uh, the uh, long axis of the platter had the Nile going down it, and it's surrounded on all sides by water. And this makes sense, because if you're an Egyptian, the only direction you've explored is north, and you hit water there. So the water's, um, it makes sense to say that the water's on all sides. And the, um, this, this essential structure is fairly common, this whole idea of a stationary Earth with a dome of the sky over it and some features based on the um, places that people live. And this is good science. I mean, they looked at the world, and they made a model. They saw what they saw, and, put that, and that's what it was. Because, I mean, to, to say that it's a stationary Earth makes perfect sense. We don't see the Earth move. The Earth is stationary. We look at it, and that, that, that's our data. The Earth is stationary, and that's what we put in our model. The Greeks and Babylonians, or I'm sorry, the Egyptians and Babylonians were the first to systematically start observing the heavens. Um, they moved past just these basic cosmologies, and they started um, doing what we would more recognize as science. The invention of the, um, I can't pronounce this word, a gnomon, uh, is a crucial step to this. What? Geonim. Geonim? Okay. Um, essentially, the, we, we still see this in a sundial. It's the, um, the part that sticks up in the sundial. You stick a stick in the ground, and you look at it over time on a flat surface, and the shadow shows you the position of the sun in the sky. Because the sun clearly is doing things in the sky, but you can't really measure just by looking up. So instead, you stick a stick in the ground and you measure the shadows it makes. And when they did this, they found that there were um, repeating but confusing patterns. Um, that uh, the sun would be in a different place in the sky in the winter than it would be in the summer. And they began to, be, but they were able to systematically write this down, this discrepancy, for the first time. And they uh, and they found and they, they came up with something to explain it, and this is this is really cool. So the stars we can we can we can think of the stars uh, as essentially um, we we can make a star map in other words. We can make it we can uh, the stars 
as they turn, stay in the same place. They go in the same circles. The North Star essentially doesn't move. Things a little bit further move the surface around the North Star. Things uh, far from the North Star go all the way around. But the idea is that essentially the stars, the stars are easy to understand. They move in circles. If you draw a star map, then the sun's movement forms a circle right on the star map. It's not a simple pattern in real life. You look at the, the genoma, and it doesn't, it doesn't follow any pattern. But if you look at it on the stars, then it forms what's called the ecliptic, which is the circle within the uh, star map. And that's a, that explains the motion of the sun. I mean, if you draw a circle on a star map, that predicts exactly what you would expect to see um, with it, the star, sun in the actual sky. Now, there's no interpretation to this yet. This is just a mathematical uh, feature of the sky. But this is very suggestive. It shows that we're doing something right when we think of a, 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 a star map and things moving in circles on it. It explains complicated phenomena. Um, by the fourth century BC, the um, two-sphere universe had taken over as the dominant paradigm. So the two-sphere universe is essentially that the Earth is a sphere at the center of the universe, and the stars form a much larger sphere around it. And there, this model had a lot of good features. In the first part, it jived with you know, the, our intuitive knowledge of what the world was like. The Earth is clearly stationary, and putting it at the center of a sphere lets that happen, because where is, the, is it going to fall if it's in a sphere? Because the, the center of a sphere, there's no direction, which is down. So that explains why the Earth is stationary. It um, explains, in a sense, like where the stars go as they rotate. It allows for this, um, for the, the universe to rotate on itself without moving, and for the stars to come back to where they came from, in a sense, but without this problem of where do they go after they go down below the horizon. It, um, it, it allows for the, um, if you look at the sky, the defining feature is that the sky doesn't really change. The stars stay the same. The sun does this kind of complicated thing, but it does so in a, you know, in a consistent way. So the, the sky is, um, in a sense, perfect in a way that the Earth is not. And the two-sphere universe allows for an interpretation of that. The center of the two-sphere universe, the Earth, is not, is, is not perfect. But the um, outside of the sphere is perfect. And this um, essential, this, the making the Earth a special place where things change makes perfect sense. And, but that would be odd if the Earth was just somewhere random in the universe. So by putting the Earth at the center, this makes this all make sense. Um, and the idea that the Earth itself is a sphere also has good reasons. If you look at a ship as it goes over the horizon, the bow of the ship disappears before the mast. If you're looking, if you have two people, one looking at the ship on the ground, one looking at them on top of a mountain, the person on the mountain will see it longer. These sorts of arguments um, were uh, current in the ancient world and proved that the Earth was a sphere. This idea that, you know, Columbus proved that the Earth was round is totally not true. Like, the people have realized that the Earth was a sphere for a long time. So there were good arguments for the Earth being a sphere, and good arguments for the stars being a larger sphere outside of it. And this just makes intuitive sense. You look up, you do see a, do a dome, which is exactly what you expect to see in this situation. And this has great explanatory power, because now we have a framework for interpreting what the sun is doing. The sun is influenced by the motion of the stars, in that it is somehow moved by the motion of the stars. But it also has a movement of its own. It's moving in a circle inside the, the sphere of the stars. It's not a very complicated system, but produces complicated results, exactly what we would see. So we've got a system that makes intuitive sense and provides the correct predictive power. It explains what we see. Um, there were people who disagreed with this. There was this guy named Aristarchus. He was kind of nuts. He thought the sun was at the center of the universe and the earth went around it. But he didn't really have any good reasons for this, and people you know, legitimately ridiculed him for this. Because it doesn't predict anything better. It makes everything more complicated, and it just doesn't fit with what we know. If you throw a ball up, the ball comes straight back down. But if the earth was hurtling through space, you throw the ball up and it, gets, and it um, flies away. Because we, we now have an idea of inertia that was just not popular back then, and so uh, not something that was thought of. So these sorts of arguments held a lot of sway, that 
We would expect to feel the motion of the earth. We would expect things thrown into the air to fly off. We would expect 